I'm telling you, there's a little man inside me controlling all of my moves, making me say things, even manipulating my thoughts at times. The fact that he's even letting me speak this long is a true shock. Please, you have to believe me before I lose control again, the man pleads with Dr. Fleming. The man, whose name is Chris, by the way, contorts in a way Dr. Fleming had never thought possible. She chokes back vomit as Chris turns his head 360 degrees like the girl from The Exorcist. Then he sits straight forward and smiles. Sorry about that, Dr. Fleming. <laughs> Sometimes I just like to play these elaborate jokes to try and get a rise out of people. Certainly didn't mean to make you puke a little bit. He sniffs the air. You tasted some of your shampoo this morning, didn't you? She had. Dr. Fleming shakes her head no and leaves the room. She walks down to the broom closet and goes inside to find Dusty, the janitor, looking at his phone. He quickly puts it away when he sees her and pretends to be sweeping the floor. Oh, there's no time for this, Dusty. Come with me. She grabs him by the scruff of his janitor's overalls and races back to Chris's room. She opens the door to find it empty. What? How could this be? He was just here. Dr. Fleming races out to the hall and peeks in the windows of the other rooms for Chris. Dusty, unsure why he was called into the room, begins looking on the ground for debris to sweep. The floor looks pretty clean, he decides, but why else would he be called into the room like this, grabbed by the fucking nape of the neck like a fucking child? Surely there must be some trash under the bed, Dusty thinks. His knees crack as he crouches to look under the bed, falling right into Chris's trap. Chris, still under the control of a small man, steps forward from the wall, having been camouflaged like a chameleon to it the whole time. Dusty, still peering under the bed, is none the wiser as Chris bonks him on the head with a vase, knocking him unconscious and sending him to the ground. Chris lunges to the ground after him and begins violently undressing him, ripping the clothes and flesh off of him in the process. Dusty startles awake at the pain of being violently torn apart by a man under the influence of a smaller man and shrieks in horror. Dr. Fleming bursts back into the room to find Chris ripping Dusty apart, blood streaming down his face, spurting from him everywhere. Dusty's eyes plead with the doctor for help as his mouth screams in agony. Chris! Dr. Fleming tries to scream over Dusty's wails. She starts beating on his back with her fists and bashing the call nurse light on the wall. Chris, with his right hand, pushes Dr. Fleming back against the wall with inhuman force. He gets Dusty's shirt off of his body and starts putting it on himself, giving Dusty momentary relief. Doctor, Doctor Fleming, Wh why, why, why did you call me in here? Dusty whimpers as his body starts to convulse in a violent seizure that ends his life. Doctor Fleming sobs. She had only brought Dusty in here to verify that someone else was seeing what she was seeing, and the worst part, he was only three days from retirement. Why hadn't she got the floor's other psychiatrist? Dr. Fleming knew she would need to up her prescription of Celexa to get over this trauma. Chris, finally dressed in all of Dusty's clothes, shapeshifts into a stepladder, which rocks back and forth a little bit from the momentum of the shapeshift and then comes to a halt. Dr. Fleming blinks her eyes a few times to try and clear them. There's still a stepladder in the middle of the room where Chris had once been. C -c Chris? Dr. Fleming whimpers into the room. No response. She looks around cautiously and starts to edge towards the ladder. Reaching out her left hand, she carefully pokes it. Nothing. She knocks it over with a kick and quickly scoots back to the wall as if to brace for an explosion. But nothing. She stands up and walks to the overturned ladder. Why would Chris need to rip apart Dusty just to turn into a stepladder? It didn't make any sense to Dr. Fleming, and she wasn't sure it ever would. Even if Chris had been telling the truth earlier about the little man controlling him, how could Dr. Fleming wrap her brain around something that literally defied the laws of physics? Dr. Fleming grabs the ladder and quickly heads to the broom closet. She turns on the light and starts searching for zip ties, rope, yarn, anything she could use to tie up the ladder and stop it from opening. Finally, under Dusty's jacket, Dr. Fleming finds some rope and proceeds to bound the ladder's legs shut. Satisfied with her handiwork, she heads for the staircase. Springfield Regional Medical Center isn't a very tall building, but Dr. Fleming thinks that she can get Chris to transform back into a human being after a couple drops down four flights of stairs. 
She entered the stairwell on the fourth floor and holds the stepladder over the gap. Get a good look, Chris. <laughs> That's right. I've got you now. I'll give you to the count of three to change back. Otherwise, you're going down. Clanking all the way, Dr. Fleming said, her voice not trembling at all. Dr. Fleming counts down from three and then waits a few seconds before dropping the step ladder. Along the way, it hits every single railing of the four floors below it. Crashing and clanking, the step ladder finally slams to a rest in the hospital's basement near the administrative wing. She races down the stairs and grabs the ladder, laughing. Ha ha ha! How'd that feel, Chris? She screams, glistening with sweat. The door to the stairwell suddenly opens, and Dr. Fleming's supervisor, Michelle Gherkin, walks in. A tall lesbian, Michelle has a commanding presence and has been the manager of the behavioral health team for the last four years. What is going on in here? Michelle demands. Well... Dr. Fleming pauses to catch her breath, still feeling the effect of the four flights. How Chris hadn't transformed after all that, she will never know. Go on with it. What's with all the loud banging and screaming coming from in here? And why do you have a stepladder? Michelle questions. Dr. Fleming wipes the sweat from her forehead as she unties the stepladder and props it up. Dr. Gherkin, this isn't just an ordinary stepladder. No, no. This is Chris. That patient we got tonight from the homeless shelter... He's some sort of shape-shifting wizard. Or, well, I, I guess I should say, she coughs. He's being controlled by some sort of shape-shifting wizard. Now, if I believe the magic I've seen today, which I do, I do, then I have to believe my patient. He's being controlled by some being, the, the likes of which we've never seen, Doctor. Dr. Fleming explains. She grabs the stepladder and starts to shake it. I'm not sure how to get it to snap out of this form. Now, that's why I threw it down the stairs, but it didn't work. She turns to Dr. Gherkin, who is completely dumbfounded. You're... You're... You're saying that this is some small, magical being that is controlling a homeless psych patient to shapeshift into a stepladder. Dr. Fleming nods to confirm everything that Michelle had just said, proud of her ability to debrief a fellow doctor. Michelle nods and slowly exits the stairwell without saying a word. Probably going to get a medical textbook to try and help me diagnose my patient, Dr. Fleming thinks fondly as she's stabbed with a horse tranquilizer by an orderly and strapped into a straitjacket by her boss. Three days later, Dr. Fleming wakes up in one of Springfield Regional Medical Center's padded rooms. She slowly comes to and realizes where she is and thrashes in her bed, shocked to find that she is strapped at both ankles and wrists. She writhes and smashes her head back into her pillows and screams at the top of her lungs. Dr. Gherkin enters the room and claps a ruler down onto her knuckles. That is enough screaming, Dr. Fleming. She sticks her fingers into Dr. Fleming's mouth and probes all around her gums, much to Dr. Fleming's dismay. Dr. Fleming spits out Dr. Gherkin's fingers and screams, What the fuck are you doing, Michelle? Why do you have me tied up? What in God's name is going on? Dr. Gherkin strokes Dr. Fleming's cheek with the back of her hand. She coos gently and shushes Dr. Fleming and hums Rockabye Baby. Dr. Fleming starts to drift to sleep when she notices the stepladder in the corner of the room. Oh my god! He still hasn't come out! We have to help him, Michelle! Untie me! She begins to chew at her wrist restraints. Dr. Fleming, that is enough! Now this is going to be hard to hear, but you have had some sort of psychotic break. Now, we have video surveillance of you luring a co-worker into a patient's room. That co-worker was found brutally and viciously murdered. Your patient? He's missing. Now, I'm not sure what's gone wrong, Jessica, but I'm going to try my hardest to get you restored back to your old self, okay? You can trust me, Michelle says as she wipes tears from Dr. Fleming's face. You, you don't believe me? Dr. Fleming sobs. Jessica, Jessica, do I believe that your patient is being controlled by a microscopic homicidal wizard? No, I don't, Dr. Gherkin says. It's at that exact moment that the stepladder shapeshifts back into Chris and strides across the room. In one quick motion, Chris reaches out to Dr. Gherkin and scalps her. 
Dr. Gherkin, blindsided by the searing pain of having her scalp ripped off, turns and shrieks in horror at the sight of Chris, no longer a stepladder, as blood seeps down her face. Dr. Fleming, still tied up, cheers on Chris as he pummels Dr. Gherkin to a pulp, if only for the vindication of having been proven right to her before her death. Chris finishes off Dr. Gherkin and begins putting on her clothes. Dr. Fleming begins shrieking at the top of her lungs, Help! 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 Over and over again to try and alert the nurses and fellow doctors to her struggle. If she could just get someone in here long enough to see Chris, then they'd have to believe her. Jerry, the only male nurse on the floor, bursts into the room. He's shocked to see Dr. Fleming tied up as a patient. He doesn't notice Chris on the ground in the corner still dressing himself in Dr. Gherkin's skin. Well, now what the heck is going on in here, Dr. Fleming? Jerry says, still making unwavering eye contact with Dr. Fleming and refusing to look at Chris on the floor. Please, look over there! Dr. Fleming screams out, but Jerry doesn't budge his gaze except to open the medical file at the foot of the bed and read it. Jerry is stunned at what he reads, his own colleague gone stark raving insane and on a killing spree. He shakes his head as he returns the file to the foot of the bed. Dr. Fleming begs with Jerry to please, please, please just look over in the corner of the room, but Jerry doesn't listen to crazy people. He administers a dose of an antipsychotic that he finds in a medicine cup on her bedside table. By now, Chris is fully dressed in Dr. Kirkin's clothes and transforms into her. Not attempting to do an accent or voice of any kind, Chris, now completely passing as Dr. Gherkin, dismisses Jerry, who quickly leaves the room, terrified of Dr. Gherkin. Dr. Fleming begins to cry, knowing that she is truly trapped here. Unless someone sees Chris at this point, they will never believe her, and why should they? The whole thing sounds absolutely crazy. Why are you crying, Dr. Fleming? Chris, as Dr. Gherkin asks. You're... You're making them think I'm insane. And they're they're giving me drugs and, and tying me up and slapping me, she explains. Chris sits down on the foot of her bed and considers a second before shifting back into his normal form. I don't know why he's doing this to you specifically, Dr. Fleming. I, I'm really sorry, Chris says, suddenly sounding like himself. Dr. Fleming sits up and assesses the man sitting in front of her. Chris? Like, like Chris, Chris, not the guy controlling Chris? Yeah, it's me, doctor. I'm, I'm really sorry this is happening to you. He reaches out and puts his hand on hers and begins stroking it. Dr. Fleming lets herself feel the comfort for a split second before shrieking again, Help! 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 While grabbing on to Chris with both her arms and legs. He struggles and writhes on top of her as she holds him and screams. Jerry bursts back into the room just in time to see Dr. Fleming in the act of strangling her missing patient, Chris. He doesn't hesitate as he pulls out his state-issued taser and sends 50,000 volts right into her skull and chest. There hadn't been much training when the state issued tasers to every government employee, and Jerry didn't know how to properly aim the electrodes, and when he pulled the trigger, he sent a lethal amount of electricity right into Dr. Fleming's brain and her heart, which ended her life immediately. No one was ever able to determine what really happened that day with Chris, the little man controlling him, Dr. Fleming, or Jerry. Jerry was the only person to see Dr. Fleming struggle with Chris as Chris instantly transformed into a vase, which shattered when it hit the floor, ending his life as well. Jerry, however, still had to face the consequences of his actions, killing a patient with a state-issued taser over a confrontation that no one could witness happening, and was committed to the insane asylum himself, where he resides to this day. Dr. Fleming donated her body to Wright State University, where they probed her brain for any medical abnormalities. Finding none, they transferred care of her body to Texas State University's Body Farm, where they studied the effects of sewer water on body decomposition. End. That was Dr. Fleming and the Shapeshifter, and hear ye, hear ye, read all about it, hot off the presses! That's the newest uh, finished thing I've written. That's uh, actually the the first thing I've written in a long time. Um, all the other stories up until that point were written pre-coronavirus. 
So here we are in a new world, folks. I'm I'm back to writing, I guess. Um, it's been I I really enjoyed writing that story. It took me a while to get through it because I kept coming back to it and and trying to figure out how to end it. Uh, as I was writing it, as soon as I as soon as Chris shapeshifts into the stepladder for the first time, I as the author just was completely dumbfounded and could not even begin to imagine w- how to write myself out of that situation. But it was such a bizarre, absolutely uh, out of left field thing to happen that I wanted to to keep it in the story. Now I gotta I gotta go on a little rant here for just a minute because I'm fucking dripping sweat. Okay, now I think it's it's 2020, and and by the time I mean fuck, we're gonna blink our eyes and it's gonna be 2021. So, hell, I'm going to be 25 any fucking day, it seems like. September 7th's right around the corner, and it, um, um, life is careening. And it's just like Brad Paisley says, Don't blink, because just like that, you're six years old, and you take a nap, and you what? Wake up, and you're 25. Well, you know what? You're goddamn right, Brad. And all of a sudden, here I am staring at 25, dripping in sweat, because for some reason, it's 2020 and not every house has air conditioning, central air. Now, I know houses that were built before a certain time, just blah, 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 bullshit, bullshit, bullshit. Air conditioning is a human right. Heating is a human right. Why isn't every house outfitted with air conditioning? Why isn't every house outfitted with heat? These are things that, yeah, okay, technically you don't need them to live. I'm, I'm fucking alive right now, but am I living? No, I'm not comfortable. In my own home. Last year, when we moved into this fucking house, last year in the middle of, at the very end of the late heat of August, the middle of fucking late August, I had flour and sugar up in the top shelf of my cabinet just in the bag i don't have a i don't have a flower jar i want one but hell i don't have one i've asked for one for christmas for years but nobody wants to buy me a fucking flower jar i guess and you know i don't want just some generic flower jar which is what i'll end up having i want like cookie monster to be full of flour instead of cookies whatever all i'm saying is i had this shit up in the top of my cabinet and wouldn't you know that the bottom of the bag fucking baked to the top of the shelf when i went to get the flour out of the top shelf it was so hot up there that the bottom of the bag had started baking to the shelf and it ripped the bag imagine cleaning up that mess which included moldy hot baked flour it was absolutely repulsive. And yet it's only because this fucking house is so goddamn hot. Now, I get it. It's just the time that it was built and, you know, what have you. But this house has heat. So all the, all the registers are here. All the duct work exists. How fucking hard would it be to throw a fucking air conditioner into that mix? Now, maybe I'm stupid and I just don't know enough about the duct work and HVAC and all this shit and what it actually takes to have a heating and a cooling system in your home. But to me, it seems to follow that if they just, if the people that own this home would just have an air conditioner hooked up and, and plugged into the existing duct work, why wouldn't that work? And it's so goddamn hot guys. And, And listen, and I'm not talking about like, oh man, oh man, it's 70 in here. No, it's over 80 degrees in my home. Now I've got window air conditioners. I'm sitting right in front of a window air conditioner, but I'm also recording a fucking podcast. So it's not on. So I'm sweating, but you know what's going on in my room right now? My cat's in there. My dog's in there. Kelly and Fran, they're both in there. Kelly's screaming at the door because she misses me and maybe she has to use the restroom, which is not in my bedroom, but they're locked in there because they make noise and I'm recording a podcast and you know what else makes noise? Air conditioners. And guess where else there's an air conditioner running? In my bedroom and it's going to be so cold in there. I can't wait to walk in there when I'm done recording this little outro here. 
drink your prune juice, you old bat.